You know my name. I don't have to be introduced by anybody. And uh, I want to, first of all, express my thanks to you for coming. I know some of you had to travel 45 minutes to get here. So uh, is that a, another audience member? Or? No. OK. <laughs> And also, I should probably thank the library for inviting me to give my talk. Uh, they said there's going to be some food here. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'll do it. I'm the man for all seasons. I have a feeling the food is not going to come, but maybe they're waiting until the end. Yes. They generally do, yeah. Are you going to give us hot popcorn while you're speaking, though? <laughs> you can have it, yeah. Just have that food for thought. If you have time, after I finish, you can take a look at the books. There are 15 of them and the two posters, oh the only ones that I had made. Well, this handout I prepared so that you could take it home and look at it. You don't need to look at it now. It gives a something I call the career arc mm -hmm. of a half a century of scholarship. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll preface what I have to say about my books with a very brief vita. Everybody says vita, but it's, the traditional pronunciation is vita, you know, V-I-T-A. I adhere to the British old school pronunciation. So I would say curriculum vitae. Yeah, but that's what they say, vitalis. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born in Japan. Uh, the fifth son, five boys, my parents, and my mother actually had a miscarriage of twins, boys, so we would have been seven. But it's of some interest uh, to tell them about my parents because I believe that every child bears the imprint of their parents for the rest of their lives in one way or another, no matter what, for good or for ill. And if they become drug addicts or criminals, then there's to some degree the responsibility of their parents. Absolutely. But my parents, who were both born in Russia, were classical musicians. My father was a cellist, but he also was a conductor and a poet and a composer. My mother was a pianist, a brilliant concert pianist who gave uh, concerts in Japan mostly. What happened was that they met in Japan, in Germany, in Berlin in 1925. They were both immigrants because they had left Russia. My mother actually grew up in China because even though she was born in Odessa in what is now Ukraine, her father, uh, who was a contractor, uh, left Ukraine because of pogroms. There was a terrible pogrom in 1905, just the year that my mother was born. There was a famous Odessa pogrom where the, the Russian police came and started shooting Jews. You know. So he decided to leave. And he was one of the people that built the Trans-Siberian Railroad. And so he just took the railroad to Harbin, which is in Manchuria. And my mother, who was born in Ukraine, grew up not speaking Chinese, there was a Russian community in China there in Harbin, in Manchuria, about 50,000 Russians and Ukrainians living there. So she went to school there. And then, interestingly enough, that's why I'm telling it, because this is, I don't think there is any other such story. When she was a 16-year-old child, she graduated from high school in Harbin and decided she wanted to go to Berkeley, of all places, UC Berkeley. Well, I don't know how they found out. So she was, this was 19, she was born in 05, so that's in 21. 1921, she went to Berkeley. She spent a semester there and decided that it wasn't for her. She wanted to become a concert pianist. So she went to New York, lived in Queens of all places because there was a friend there, and then went to Berlin to a famous conservatory called the Hochschule für Musik. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. The high school, you know, Hochschule means higher school for music. And uh, she actually got a diploma 
from, and from a famous teacher. And one fine day in 1925, she was at home uh, in Berlin when she heard a voice. And she told me that she fell in love with the voice before she saw the face. And it turns out that love at first sight runs in families because my wife, Marianne, and I fell in love immediately. We only saw each other nine times before we were married. Can you imagine <laughs> marrying somebody you've only seen nine times? Anyway, my mother and father met in Berlin, and they had to post bands in those days. Do you know what bands are, B-A-N-N-S? Yes. You know, where in, it was not a religious ceremony. You had to post an announcement. And I found out the reason mainly was because they didn't want people who had something against the groom, mostly, including unpaid debts, to come and dis uh, to uh, disrupt the marriage. So they, I think the bans were t several weeks. You had to post these things in newspapers and other places. Well, anyway, they got married in December uh, of uh, 20, I'm sorry, 1925. And then because of the Nazis, the Nazis were already active, can you imagine, in Berlin in 1925, parades and people, and my father, who was psychic and which I inherited, one day my mother told me the story, opened the window, looked outside and said, get dressed, we have to leave immediately. And they went to Paris because his parents uh, were living in Paris. They had fled Russia. To flee, everybody has to flee. <laughs> So they had fled, and they fled to Paris, and then went to Palestine, no Israel yet. And their first children, twins, were born there. And uh, you actually met Joseph, right? Of course. Yeah. He came here. He came to Vermont, yeah. My oldest brother, Joseph, who ended up in the Soviet Union and became a communist and died of, of regret, mostly. Oh. He was murdered, actually, by somebody who wanted his computer. But anyway, my parents, so they went through this period in Palestine, but they couldn't find a job. So they went to Japan because Japan wanted to start classical music. There were aristocrats in Japan who wanted to start classical music. So they invited mostly Russian and German Jews who were at loose ends because of Germany and Russia. You know, Soviet Union and Nazism. So um, they came to Japan and started playing, teaching. My father became a professor at the conservatory in Tokyo. And they were there for 25 years, through the war. And I was born in 39, so I was there just before the war started. And of course, Pearl Harbor is 41. So we were in Tokyo at the end of the war. Through the war, when the bombs came, I still remember in 44 and 45, being bombed in Tokyo, we had to evacuate ourselves. And I grew up in Japan speaking Japanese before I learned English. I spoke Russian at home because that was my mother tongue. My father insisted as soon as we crossed the threshold, no matter what we spoke outside, he insisted, and he was a very domineering father, that we speak Russian. So all boys, and we all spoke Russian at home, and I speak Russian fluently, so that when Russians meet me now, they can't believe it because I speak an old-fashioned Russian that they can only hear from the stage. Only stage actors can, <laughs> that accent, you know. Imagine the British, you know, the Queen's English, but now it's the King again, but spoken in such a way that you only hear it in plays or movies. So I speak this funny Russian, and I spoke fluent Japanese because I spoke with my friends. All my playmates were Japanese in the street, so I speak native yeah. Japanese, and I actually ended up going to Japan for a postdoctoral year to the University of Tokyo and spent one year there studying with the dean of Japanese linguists and wrote papers about Japanese. So among my uh, <laughs> are Japanese papers. And strangely enough, my daughter, can you believe this? I never said a word to her about what to study. She went to Harvard. She's majored in East Asian Langs and Civs. <laughs> Japanese, and she went to Japan, studied there, uh, became uh, a manager, a financial manager. I met her husband, David, who's here, 
in freshman Japanese class at Harvard, and they've been together ever since. And uh, you, you speak English kind of okay. Yeah. <laughs> when when did you? Uh, yeah. Did don't you... don't hesitate to interrupt. By the way. When did you learn English? When I was uh, five years old, because my mother was a t music teacher at the American School in Japan. When the occupation came to Japan, the American occupation came. They set up a school, which actually was an old private school called the American School in Japan. They just took it over because all the Americans, of course, had left. But when the occupation came, the army mostly, but there was some Navy too, they had, as a, an exception, because only American children were allowed to go there, as an exception, they allowed me to enroll at this school because my mother was the music teacher there. And that's how I learned English. I didn't, so I started English when I was five, uh, six actually, because 46 is when I, uh, so just short of being seven, I started English. And then we immigrated to America in 52 to Los Angeles. And do you know why we settled in Los Angeles? My father saw a postcard with palm trees on it, Beverly Hills, and said, let's go there. <laughs> no, this is true. <laughs> And I went to school in LA, including Hollywood High. I'm a graduate of Hollywood High, with all the actors, you know. Uh, there were actors there, including the Nelson boys, uh, uh, Ricky and, and what was his? David. David, yeah. Uh, you know, Ozzie Nelson, Ozzie and Harriet? Yeah, I don't know if you can remember the. Yeah, Ricky Nelson and I played tennis together. He was a varsity tennis player at Hollywood High, and so was I. But I, the singles group was so good that I had to play doubles. So I played doubles, first doubles. Unfortunately, Ricky Nelson was killed in a plane crash. You know, he became a, a musician, right. Uh, well, since my parents had no money, I couldn't apply to a private school, so I applied to UCLA for college. And it was a good school. There were people who wanted to make it good there. They had been actually invited to take over the administration at UCLA. This was 1950s. And um, I had very good teachers. I majored in Slavic languages. I started out by majoring in uh, chemistry and physics. I wanted to be an engineer. But after two years of that, I decided I did not want to be an engineer. <laughs> Why, I don't know. So I decided, why not improve my Russian? I'd never gone to a Russian school. I spoke fluent Russian, but I'd never studied grammar. So I majored in Slavic languages and had very good teachers from Harvard, actually, PhDs who had come to UCLA to teach. And um, so I got my BA at UCLA and then went to Harvard and uh, graduated in a record time of three years. I only spent three years at Harvard because I had already written my, my uh, PhD dissertation in my mind. And I had a, uh, the most famous linguist in the world was my teacher, but he and I didn't get along because I kept uh, writing things in my dissertation which didn't agree with what he had published. This must have been Roman Jakobson. Roman Jakobson, yes. I don't know if that name means anything to you. And uh, I, in fact, wrote an article about our relationship which is being read constantly. I keep getting these emails saying, so-and-so has just read your paper on, called Roman Jakobson in Retrospect. And uh, the subtitle is the um, something reminiscent, I don't remember, reminiscences of a, a stiff-necked student. <laughs> Nobody says stiff-necked anymore. But it meant, it meant Jews, you know, stiff-necked. In the Bible, the stiff-necked ones are the Jews, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. The ones that don't want to adhere to the orthodoxy are stiff necked. But we made it up at the end. We, before he died, he and I took a taxi from the airport after coming home from a conference together. And I think he forgave me for all the, uh, the least majesties, you know, that I took it with his stuff. No, of course. And I published. Funny thing was that he made me take. I think four chapters out of my dissertation, all of which I published as articles. <laughs> That's not a way to ingratiate yourself with your professor. 
<laughs> now I'll get to the meat of this session. You can see that I've published quite a lot of books, and you can, um, if you want more information, I have a blog called languagelore.net. At the bottom of the page, you can check that out. And also, I established a website called Marianne and Michael Shapiro. Yeah, my wife, Marianne, whom I met in New York, I'm married after nine meetings, <laughs> was a scholar. She was the, the most accomplished and most versatile scholar of Italian language and literature in the United States in the 20th century. This is a, not just me saying it, it was just, it's a fact. But she died, unfortunately, of cancer very quickly. She was never sick in her life. One day she woke up with sarcoma, and a year and a half later she was dead. And I think of her every day. And uh, there's no way that anybody could replace her, because she and I fell in love right away, and we were together all the time. And uh, she had a terrible academic life, despite all her publications. The Italians did not, the men, didn't want her playing in their sand pile, you know, because she was doing, Dante was her specialty. And of course, to be a dentist is the most prestigious thing you can be as an Italianist. And she wrote several books about Dante, many articles, and these were breakthroughs. There were new things. How much new can you say about Dante? Yes. You know? But she did. She said new things, because she found new things about the verse, especially the Divine Comedy. Anyway, she and I collaborated so that her name and mine are together on several of the books that are displayed, and I'll talk about them. The, the, <clears throat> I guess that I was not an easy student to deal with. And looking back, I think it's because I knew more than my professors already. That's, That's not a good thing, <laughs> no. And, um, you know, I'm, this sounds well, I like... I thought I did. <laughs> but that's not quite There's the same a difference. Thing. <laughs> no. Well, you know, I had Russian and Japanese as la native languages. There was no other student like that. And there's no Slavist that has that East Asian connection that I know of. Maybe in Japan now there are some. But um, the first year I was at Harvard, I'm talking now about the last book on this list. Russian Phonetic Variants and Phonostylistics. Phonostylistics, for those of you that have never encountered this term, is the study of sounds as they are used differently depending on the style of the speech act. So depending on who you're talking to or what the kind of conversation you're having, you may change what you pronounce. Yeah, phonostylistics. And it may have class associations, you know, people of different classes. <coughs> well, anyway, the first year I was there was 1961. And it was the first year that the Slavic department at Harvard had instituted a requirement. They had never had it before, that all MA students had to write an essay, you know, a master's essay. Up to that point, most schools, if you are a master's student, you don't write an essay. You just take the courses and you get a, a master's degree. Harvard, in the Slavic department, had decided to for, force students to write an essay for the master's. And you know what I did? I published that master's essay, <laughs> which is almost never done. You, know, you don't hear of, of books that start as master's essays. <laughs> thinking? Why did they decide to do this? I don't know. They wanted to make it hard to get a degree. Uh, it was a very uh, rambunctious group of professors there, including Jacobson. They were always fighting with each other. It was split in two. And they were at odds with each other. They didn't say hello to each other in the hall. I'm not joking. This is what the kind of department it was. And then the students suffered because depending on which professor you took as your advisor, you immediately set yourself against the other group. Yeah. You know, and oh. I chose Jakobsen. For master's essay, you did not have to have an advisor. You did it on your own. But I published it, and the University of California Press published it 
And uh, it was actually cited by scholars in Russia. They had not had this kind of work done by Russian scholars. Then the following year in 69, I decided to publish those things from my dissertation that had been removed because Jakobsen said uh, that they didn't belong there, you know. Aspects of Russian morphology is the study of the form of uh, the units, the linguistic units, like stems and desonances and endings. Oh, thank you. Is my voice uh, failing? Thank you. Insurance. My son-in-law, David. Yes. <laughs> so this is, and Jakobsen died in 82. So 69, he's still alive. Here I am publishing things that he will recognize as parts of my dissertation that he told me I couldn't include. What happened with my dissertation was I was about to finish when he went off for a year of sabbatical. So I had to choose a different advisor during the, that year when he was gone. And that advisor was a man named Horace Lunt, who was also a student of Jakobsen. But he was chair of the department, and he became my advisor. And he said, OK, you can do your dissertation any way you want. Because he knew me as a student, and he knew that I was a responsible person. And he knew the, the way in which Jakobsen operated. So that got published. And I had a long-standing interest in poetry because Russian children, even to this day, this does not happen in your school, I bet, Eddie, that they have to memorize poetry. No. A Russian child in 2023, in what used to be the Soviet Union, has to know certain poems by heart. Can you believe that? And I can still recite Russian poems by heart. Wow, good because I learned them as a child. My father and mother insisted that I learn these. I didn't go to a Russian school, so I learned. And I got interested. My father was a poet. He, <clears throat> I got interested. And in 1976, I published a book, <coughs> which is here, called Asymmetry, because my idea was that there is a different, an asymmetrical relation between sound and meaning especially in rhyme words, that gives the poem its thrust. And it's not just parallelisms, which is what normally is the way people talk about poetry. Everything is you know, parallel. Because of biblical parallelism, if you know your Bible, you know how it's parallelistic. And that was the way that the analysis was for ordinary uh, secular poetry. But I figured out that there is a relationship, which I then made into a kind of staple of my analysis of language. It's a te technical term called markedness, which you may never have heard of. But anyway, it's, I'm a specialist. In fact, one of my colleagues at Columbia once introduced me as the markedness man. <laughs> but he introduced me to another professor at Columbia and he said, meet Michael Shapiro. He's the markedness man. I still remember that because I had written so much about this. Markedness is the relation between sound and meaning, not just in poetry, across r several cases where one is more specialized than the other. One is simple, usual, unmarked, it's called, and then the other is marked. For instance, the difference between male and female in most languages where the gender is differentiated linguistically the female is marked. Marked means restricted, cannot be used. So of course, now with LGBTQ, you can do all kinds of things. But you can't refer to a man as she. But you could say he about a woman, even in the days before, uh, and them, and so on. Uh, but there are, for instance, Russian has a whole gender system where every word is either male Masculine, feminine, or neuter, neuter, neutral, neuter, it's called. And then the feminine is marked. So women, you are marked. That's, you can't get away from it, because linguistically, you are always going to be the marked member. 
of the opposition. It's always oppositions between marked and unmarked linguistic signs. <clears throat> and then when I got married in 1967 to an Italianist who taught me many things about medieval, she was a medievalist and Renaissance scholar. She wrote about Petrarch, has books on Petrarch. Not Petrarch, by the way, Petrarch is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> Petrarca in Italian, Petrarca. Correct in the meaning English. Yeah. People say Petrarch, but it's not Petrarch, it's Petrarch. But he's Italian. I know, but the English, British English pronunciation, which I stick to, is Petrarch. Anyway, she I don't like the British. <laughs> well, that's. So I, I use the Italian. Okay. We, you say in English? We fought, we fought a war against those guys. Yeah, but are you going to say Petrarca if you're talking to somebody in English? Petrarca, no. Oh. <laughs> One thing that she and I collaborated on throughout our life together is language, but she was a, not a linguist, but strictly speaking. She was a literary scholar. She, had, she could speak fluent French and Italian, and she also specialized in old Provençal. That's, you know, the troubadours. Uh, so she wrote about the troubadours. But anyway, through this marriage, and we're always talking to each other and showing each other what we wrote. Did you switch languages from time to time? Just no, she had actually studied Russian at Barnard. She went to Barnard, where my granddaughter now goes. And she had studied Russian, but it wasn't good enough to speak. And I didn't speak Italian. My French was lousy. So, <laughs> you know, whenever we went to France together, she did all the talking. <laughs> And everybody said, uh, you're from Paris, aren't you? She said, no, I'm an American, because her language is so good. And you know what they said in Italy when she spoke Italian? They would say, this is a, up your alley. They would say, you speak fluent Italian, but it sounds like radio announcer speech. <laughs> because she was not, you know, an Italian always has a local accent, Venetian, Roman, whatever it is, Florentine. And she spoke pure Italian. Cleaned up. Yeah, cleaned up. And so we got interested, I got interested in the structure of literary language, and that's, that's what a trope is, hierarchy and the structure of tropes. So we wrote a book which I think still stands as the analysis of metaphors and metonymies and other kinds of tropes, similes. And that's called the hierarchy and the structure of tropes published by Indiana University. And we got to, through the study of what is called semiotics. I don't know if that word means anything to you. It's the study of sign systems. Anything that can signify is a sign. So uh, it could be a smile on your face signifying something, or you're pointing at something, that's a, a sign. But ling linguistic signs, um, are also signs. They are capable of signifying, so they're signs. Excuse me, I've been wondering about that word for a long time. Sign? Does, yeah, does it not mean the, the way the Japanese write? Or does it no, that's one kind of sign. Sign is a much, okay. yeah. And the way I got interested in sign theory was a collaborator of mine, I mean, a friend, who was actually the best man at our wedding by the name of Henning Anderson, a Dane who now lives in Los Angeles. Uh, he and I became friends at Harvard, and he introduced me to the writings of Charles Sanders Peirce, P-E-I-R-C-E, -E, whose dates are 1839 to 1914. He's the greatest mind the America's ever produced, yes. bar none. Yes. The great, he is the only American philosopher that belongs with Kant and Hegel and Aristotle. He is that great, but of course nobody knows him, and they constantly mispronounce his last name. They say Pierce. It's actually his family that was an old Boston family, New England family, that migrated to America and brought their name, but it was spelled P-E-R-S, which is the Petrus, you know, Peter. Petrus, the stone. So Charles Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, was the philosopher that I got interested in, and I became a specialist in his philosophy, particularly as applied to language. And I'm a kind of, uh, I wrote several books that are 
Persian that have to do with sign theory as, <coughs> as developed by Peirce. And the first such book <coughs> was The Sense of Grammar, 1983, Indiana University Press, which is here. Language is semiotic. He had a, he didn't, the reason it's spelled S-E-M-E-I-O-T instead of just S-E-M-I-O is that he wanted it to look more Greek because the Greek word for sign is semeion, S-E-M-E-I-O-N, semeion. So I decided that this was my foray into Persian semiotics. I would call that book according to the way Peirce wanted that word spelled. It's pronounced the same in semiotic, whether it's E-I or I. Then my first, well, after my collaboration with Marianne, on the structure and content, essays in applied semiotics, which includes several articles that we had written together, uh, we decided to try to bring it, you know, that kind of book, pre-publications, working papers of the Toronto Semiotic Circle, nobody's gonna read that. And not every library will order it. So I decided um, that it should be published republished with additions by a, an academic press. So I approached Princeton where I was uh, teaching for four years. I taught at Princeton for four years, the worst four years of my academic life because I got caught in a war between two departments where the chairman of my department wanted me to get tenure and his enemy oh. uh, didn't want anything that this guy wanted, whatever he wanted, he didn't want. So I didn't get my, and I should have gotten tenure at Princeton, but I didn't. Um, figuration in verbal art has both language and literature, poetry, even folklore, because I began to get interested in folk verse. And then I taught folklore at Brown and at UCLA. Uh, UCLA was my first academic job, 1963, uh, and then 66. I taught folk literature, Russian folk literature, and at Brown University as well. So figuration and verbal art, you know, these are all out of print, of course, but you can get them online if you want to buy them. Sometimes they're only $12. <laughs> uh, so that was well received and published by an academic press, prestigious academic uh, press. By the way, the word prestigious is pronounced just that way, not prestigious. <laughs> Uh, I'm, the reason I'm giving you these comments is because I became interested in English. Ultimately, as I worked my way up to 2023, I got interested in English as a subject, not just uh, for writing, but writing. I wrote a book called The Speaking Self, English Usage, uh, Language Law and English Usage, about how people mispronounce things. Because uh, I'm always ta listening to the radio and hearing even the BBC people making mistakes. So I compiled a 500-page book of mistakes with commentary, <laughs> mainly mistakes, not all. But <clears throat> so the sense of change, the sense of grammar is about grammar as a, as a synchronic, that means contemporaneous thing, what you're saying now, not historical. So I decided that History is important because it's always embedded in what we say now. It's a historical fact that it came into being and persisted. And this is one of the tenets of my theory of language, that any uh, contemporary description of language always involves a historical element. It's not that you say that you're speaking Old English. It's just that there are elements of Old and Middle English and Early Modern English which persist into contemporary English. And they sometimes explain why you say things the way you do. <clears throat> Isn't this the way language evolves? Yes, this evolution of language necessarily has a historical dimension. <clears throat> and so I thought that the sense of grammar is not enough. I needed to produce a book which talked about change as a, his as a theoretical subject. And I published The Sense of Change, Language as History. And I mean that literally. Language always contains historical elements. Um, they might maybe uh, 
things which don't make sense in terms of contemporary language. So they're just there because that's the usage dictates that you say it that way, even though words like it are said differently. <clears throat> then after, uh, after that book, The Sense of Change, I thought it might be good to have a triptych, you know, to make a third book. Make, I like threes because Charles Peirce was a trichotomist. He always believed that there are three things, sign, object, and what he called interpretant. I won't go into that. <laughs> so the sense of form in literature and language, St. Martin's Press, that's, yes. When did I start? Well, I was always interested, but my first book where the English is prominent is uh, probably The Speaking Self, where it's devoted entirely to English, and American English in particular. But I had already written books that included articles about language, and I had published in uh, several articles in American speech. There's a very old and prestigious journal called American Speech, which is still published in North Carolina, I think, at, at Duke. Uh, so this uh, St. Martin's Press, which is now part of Rutledge, I believe, I think they became part of, you know, Rutledge is a big English, British public publisher that has several imprints. And St. Martin's agreed to publish this. And then after that, you can see that there's a gap between 1998 and 2006. Well, the main thing was my wife's death, Marianne's death. And I, uh, you know, I'm only pretending to be alive, by the way. Ever since Marianne died, I'm, I'm making a good show of it, but it's not, I'm not the same person. Uh, so I decided to write a book a novel. I'd never tried fiction before. And I just couldn't publish it. No uh, ordinary publisher would take it. I tried several, including British publishers, American. I even approached French publishers to have it translated into French. Um, they wouldn't take it. And they said the, the narrative was too complicated. That was the main excuse that I got. From, and no agent would take it because they knew that the only way an agent, literary agent, makes money is to have it published, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not going to represent you to a publisher unless they know that it's going to sell. But it's there, and there is a box set. Because in my... I got a slip case. This is called a slip case, a box. Well, I got it. A, it has a companion volume called Palimpsest of Consciousness. And I'm sure that nobody here knows what a palimpsest is. Yes, I do. You do? Oh, you, you got my book. That's why. <laughs> a palimpsest is in the study of old documents. Very often, before the advent of printing, the manuscripts are written on top of other. So like a parchment would have a manuscript that was written with, on top of something that already existed. And that's called a palimpsest, that thing that exists underneath. So the reason I called it this fancy name is in my consciousness, there are levels. And I decided that there's a level of consciousness that I can appeal to in talking about my wife. And so I decided to publish a book as a companion volume to the fiction. So it's a you know, typical academic ploy. You comment on your own work. So this is a whole book of commentary, which is 276 pages. <laughs> Can you imagine what? that much commentary? <laughs> sure. And uh, this book has been reviewed, and so has the, uh, the fiction. My wife, the metaphysician. I called her the metaphysician because that was the kind of thought that Marianne had. You know, she was a metaphysical person. Can you imagine having a wife who's a metaphysician? <laughs> but we got along. 
and we produced the greatest product of my life is my daughter, Abigail, the most wonderful daughter in the history of the universe. So these two books are now sitting in a slipcase. If you order them online, they're published. there's a self-publishing thing by Amazon. You can publish anything with Amazon. If you pay them enough, you can get things published. Yeah. Um, and I did the same thing. This Create Space 2009 is actually not part of Amazon. Uh, I decided to put together some essays, and I call it the sense of form in literature and language. And it's at that point, around 2008, sitting in Los Angeles, I decided that I'm going to put all this information I have about English uh, online, because of course now the internet had come in. And uh, so I established a blog called languagelord.net. And the speaking self, in two editions, because the first was self-published, and then I got Springer Nature, which is a large German international publisher. They published a second edition in f over 500 pages of my posts from my blog, languagelore.net. I took the posts and created a book with glossaries, because it's hard to read linguistics without a glossary. So many terms are not common to people who are not interested in language. They're interested in language, but they've not been exposed to the vocabulary of linguistics. So for each post that required it, I compile the glossary. That's what makes it 500 pages. Then I decided to approach another international publisher, Lambert Academic, to publish some things on American speech, because I had done so much on American speech, I thought it might be good to have it between two covers. And that's the thing called On Language and Value. There's several essays, using, again, Charles Peirce as a guide. And finally, I decided that something needed to be done to renovate the two books that I had published with Indiana Press, The Sense of Grammar and The Sense of Change. And so I compiled a combined edition with new things interspersed, which I call the logic of language, the semiotic study of speech. That's in the last year. And if you ask me, are you planning any new books? Uh, I just told my family. I have only one book left in me, and it's one that I've been mulling over for several years. It's called Error, A Natural History, about error in general because it's the human thing par excellence. We are the only ones. Errare humanum est, you know? John, you know Latin. Errare humanum est. To err is human. To forgive like divine. Motto on my shield. Uh -huh. <laughs> to forgive divine, but we forget about that. So I'm going to publish, if I ever live that long and have enough uh, gumption to do it, a history of error, starting with the language, not just with language, though. I'm thinking of talking about error in medicine and law, <coughs> specifically. This is a great idea for a book. Fantastic. You think so? Good. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, of course. I think if I wrote it, I could get, you know, uh, Viking or what's another, Random House or some big publisher. Yeah, because it would be medicine and law both of which I have a pretty good acquaintance with. You know, I never went to medical or law school, but I have enough knowledge about both law argumentation, l legal argumentation. I have a brother who's a lawyer living in New York that I never speak to because we fell out. And he's 90-something, 3, 92, still alive. And in fact, uh, but my, oh, me. yeah. How do you write a book about human error? Because it, it covers more than language. I know. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. I'm going to describe the word error. error occurs in every language. But it takes a different tack on describing. For instance, just to give you a comparison between English and Russian, 
In Russian, the word for error is going off the path. In English, we use the Latin errare, which is to make a mistake. Errare means to make a mistake. But we borrowed it. And what the native English word mistake is to take something wrong, right? Miss, take. You take it, but miss, take it. In Russian, you stumble from the path. In Japanese, it's. Take yeah. Mm. In, in Japanese, machingai is. A different space. Yeah. So every language has a different take. They, not, they're not all distinct from each other. Some are the same. But they have a take on error, which colors the understanding of error in each language. So I would start with a linguistic uh, description of error using several languages, uh, including German and French, which I read perfectly well. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then go from there into language use when it applies to errors in, in law and medicine. Because when doctors talk about, they don't talk about mistakes because they don't make mistakes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea. But misdiagnosis, there is such a thing. Yes. Yeah. That's an error, right? Mm -hmm. And this word miss in English, M I S, is miss. It's miss, you know, M I S S. It's the same thing. It's you, when you're throwing something, you miss it. You miss what your target is. So this kind of mental set on the concept of error would start the book, but then I would go into law, law and medicine. And maybe, I don't know, something else. But I haven't approached a publisher yet. I haven't written up a, a precy of what I would uh, say. But I should do it now that I'm finished with this other book. I'm sitting around scratching my head. Uh, you needing to be busy. Do I need to be busy? Yes. yes. Right, yes. But I'm an octogenarian. Why not just sit around and do nothing? No, no, yeah. no, that's Law and medicine have fairly specialized vocabulary. Yes. So that would be sort of what you would be analyzing? Yeah, and what they use, what kind of words they use. You know, it would have a linguistic orientation from beginning to end, but it would try to, to plumb the depths of human error because no other creature makes errors. Hmm. Animals no, they do not make errors. They don't, for instance, a bird may go after the wrong object, but it doesn't conceive of it as error because it can't speak. We are the only ones that can speak. Even birds that utter sounds that repeat what we say. Have you ever been in the presence of a parrot that utters, yeah. Or let's say um, primates like uh, chimpanzees, orangutan, bonobos use sounds, but they cannot, they never have been observed to talk about errors. They don't know what that is. They may say, don't do that, you know, or whatever language they use. They're competing with each other for mates or whatever, for food. But error is a purely human capacity. Well, it depends upon having a, a, an idea of self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Self-reflection. Self-reflection. Right. There isn't any such thing mm -hmm. in the animal kingdom. And uh, there are good German words for this description. For instance, uh, <laughs> you know, the Germans always have, a, like the word Dasein. I don't know if you know German. The way it is, Dasein. Sein is to be, and Da is there. That thing is the way it is. OK, well, I think that uh, the rest of this handout is, amplifies on my biographical material. And uh, if you're interested, you can take it home and read it. But questions, yes? Well, could we hear one of your poetry poems, memorized poems in Russian? <laughs> well, let, let's see. Uh, what poem can I? We, we won't know if you make a mistake. No, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
I'm thinking of a, maybe a dactyl, you know, where it's uh, ta ta ta. I'm sorry, I can't think of anything that <laughs> my memory fails me. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, Michael, just about your writing process. Are you somebody who revises and revises and revises, or are you somebody? I don't do much revision, no. And uh, I have very few uh, times where I've spent more than the normal amount of time just writing it from scratch and then maybe correcting a few places, but not revising all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the editors that I've had uh, to deal with, like at Princeton or even uh, Indiana, they didn't seem to have much to say about my prose. And I think, I, in, a, in a way, whenever I reread things that I wrote, I have the feeling that it's understandable. I do use recondite vocabulary. I have a tendency to use a word which is not common when I could just as well use a common word. And maybe that's showing off or you know, being academic, but I've inherited that from my father. His Russian speech was extremely recondite. Uh, he spoke, he studied philosophy in Russia and law, philosophy in Germany with Edmund Husserl, who was his famous German philosopher, was his professor, Freiburg and Breisgau. And uh, this was before he met my wife, I mean my mother. <clears throat> he became a musician, but he had intended to become a lawyer in Russia. He was a student at Moscow University when the communists came in. So he didn't finish his degree in law, and he had been reading philosophy and knew German, so he started studying in Freiburg. Um, Anyway, in the house, uh, can you imagine five boys, no. two parents, and then we also had a, a housekeeper who only spoke Russian. She was a woman who was stone deaf and only red lips. Oh. So you had to talk to her directly. And she had the habit, when she didn't want to talk to my father, she would turn the other way. Because <laughs> he was always haranguing her about something about the food or about the way the house was being kept. Uh, my father was a very strict disciplinarian. Can you imagine five boys, uh, 13 years apart from, from top to bottom? So my oldest brothers, who are twins, were 13 years older than me. When I came on the scene in 39, they were already 13 years older. And then my middle brother was 11 years, and the one that lives in New York was nine years older. So my father. Uh, always chose his language in a very academic way because he was also a poet and a composer. So he cared about, he didn't speak slang at all. So I didn't learn any slang. And Russian has a very, very uh, well-developed slang. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No. Uh, any normal Russian male, especially, has a whole vocabulary <laughs> using you know which word more than any other. Uh, always sexual, you know. And uh, my father, I never heard my father say it. I never heard him say anything slangy. He was always very, very academic, which actually served me well because I became an academic. And that's why the Russians that I meet now can't believe that, I'm, that they're talking to somebody who's not an actor, you know, putting on an act. <laughs> it's very strange. Uh, and they compliment me, you know. But they're in awe of this language, yes. Michael, did you ever take up music? Yes, I forgot to mention that. In a family where music was of the essence, you know, my parents had chamber music at home and so on, we all uh, started on the piano. My mother taught every boy the piano. But when we came to Los Angeles in 52, I decided that I didn't want to continue studying piano. And I said to my mother, you know, I asked her as a favor, do you think that you could get me a clarinet teacher? Why I chose the clarinet, I don't know. But she said, OK, if that's what you want, I'll get you a clarinet teacher. And she chose a teacher from the LA Symphony who taught private students, who came over to our apartment on Franklin Avenue in Hollywood. And I started studying the clarinet. 
And I got good enough not only to play trios with my parents, but I played quartets with members of the Hollywood High Orchestra. So I played in the orchestra in Hollywood High. I was second clarinetist because the first clarinetist was one year ahead of me, and uh, I couldn't be first. Uh, he still plays the clarinet, and he's still alive. In fact, he called me today. He's watching me on, on, the, on the live stream. He in Chula Vista, California. He's a dentist now. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, Marianne was a first-class pianist. Can you imagine? She was like a concert pianist. And my mother, when we moved to California, she started taking lessons with my mother. My mother told me that she was the best student she ever had. Imagine, she, my mother had been teaching for decades, yeah. students in Japan, in California. And Marianne was the best student she ever had. But her parents, Marianne's parents, refused to let her go to the conservatory. She wanted to become a professional concert pianist, but they refused to give her the money to go to Juilliard or some other. And so, but she and I played together all the entire clarinet, piano, duo repertoire. The entire one, you know, everything that has ever been written for clarinet and piano, we played at home. And that baby grand piano is now sitting in <laughs> Abigail and David's house in New York. That very, uh, I remember that piano, it was, we were living on East 86th Street in New York when we bought that piano. We had moved from California. Abigail was born in Hollywood, by the way. <laughs> we moved to New York because Marianne did not want to live in LA. She hated it. So <clears throat> I resigned from UCLA, which is stupid. You know, a tenured person does not resign <laughs> without getting something else. But anyway, I decided to take a flyer. And that piano we bought from Steinway in New York. And the one thing I remember was that the people had to haul it up through the window because we were on the third floor in New York. And guess what? They dropped it. They dropped it. It went on the sidewalk. But when the tuner came, he said that it, no harm had been done to that piano. No. So that piano has an interesting history. And it sounds perfectly well. Is it still being played today? Caught by clarinet. Yeah, I gave my instruments to my grandson. I don't play anymore. Because it, you know why? Because emotionally, I can't take it. I, when I play the clarinet, I can only think of my parents and my wife. I can't think of anything else. And it, you know, sometimes I'm reduced to tears. This happened to me in LA after Marianne died. My friend, who was the first clarinetist in the Hollywood High Orchestra, invited me to play with his group. And as soon as I started, yeah. I broke down in tears. I said, I can't play. So I stopped. And first class instruments, you know, French instruments, which now belong to Cotton Snotty. But you know, music is the mo has the greatest emotional power of any art form. Better, it's more than anything. Oh, yeah. And once it gets into your sister, yeah. it's, when I hear the piano on the radio when I'm in my car, a piece that I heard 17 million times because both my mother and my wife played it, Chopin, like the Barcarolle, I don't know if you know the piano oh, yes. literature. Oh, yeah. I start crying, you know. Sure. I start in the car, I'm driving, and I start crying because these were pieces that I heard as a child and also as an adult when Marianne practiced them. In fact, the last piece she practiced before she died was the Barcarolle, which I recorded. It's on my, my uh, website. If you look at MarianneMichaelShapiro.com, there is a place where you can hear the, I put all of that on, online. Any other questions? We have time, it's only. I have a question, yeah. I could ask you any time, but I'll ask you now. So no, but it might happen. be of interest to other people, well, yeah. you know how we always talk about how English is such a rich language and it borrows from so many yes. other languages? And I know the only other language I speak is Japanese, which also has a lot of borrowed words. Well, you studied French in school. Yeah, but I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there are languages, if the more what we think of as, I guess, classical languages, like Italian, Russian, you know, more sort of... Um, well, not strictly classic. yeah, classical. Classical no, is only... Not, strictly, not, not Latin and Greek, not Latin yeah. Greek. If they also have a lot of borrowed 
you know, if their if their evolution or history, as you call it, is similarly kind of a hodgepodge of other borrowed um, words, or includes that, or whether ours is the most uh, ours is the most English is the most English has the largest vocabulary. Twice the number of words, literally, as any other European language. Yeah. I never knew. That. Yeah. I and uh, is twice as large. Have you heard of Franklish? What? Franklish. Yes, I speak it. <laughs> French borrowed words from English a lot. When you hear a young, particularly French person speaking, to, yeah. they use a lot of English words. And the Japanese do something called Japlish. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Have you heard, yes. heard of Japlish? I mean, you can talk Japanese where every other word is English, but Japanized, so it sounds like Japanese. And uh, uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, let's see. How about, uh, what's a good Japanese word? Uh, hambaga. Hambaga. Of course, you can say that's an. <clears throat> Japanese, or is that simply because they don't pronounce English that well because they're not that accustomed? No, but they use that to mean that object. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Karaoke. Uh, okay. How, about, okay. How about like weekend? The French. Weekend. 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 Yeah. Weekend. Yeah. But this is exactly what happened yeah, with Latin, mm -hmm. and and it's you know, everybody needed even down the levels of society needed to be able to use this. And so literally, uh, uh, well, Italian less so, but uh, French and Spanish, Portuguese are, are bastardized versions of Latin. Yeah, but Russian is the same way. When it, for instance, a typical word like surprise, English surprise, mm -hmm. which is in French is surprise. Mm -hmm. And guess what the Russian word for surprise is? Surprise. Well, there was a lot of French, Russian. Yeah, mm. a lot of That's right. cultural borrowing, depending on circumstances, where you, what you aspire to, where you are geographically, uh, the lack of certain vocabulary in your native language, it doesn't exist. So the object, especially with contemporary science and industry, instead of making up, in, in Japanese, what used to be traditionally the case was they took Chinese morphemes, you know, Chinese word units, and Japanized them. They pronounced them a la japonaise. See, I'm speaking. A la japonaise is a perfectly good it English. Very yeah. <laughs> they would take the Chinese characters, combine them to indicate the object that they wanted to name, and then they would Japanize them. That doesn't happen anymore. They don't do that. Instead, they just take the English word. Yeah. Uh, but what you do see sometimes is you see fake Chinese characters in Japanese. Yeah. So, for instance, the, the character for rainbow, which is pronounced Niji, yeah. the Chinese had a two or three character word for that. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Japanese said, that's too long. Let's just make one word. So they yeah. yeah that's they doctor the Chinese. And it's called a Sino-Japanese compound. There is a technical term for this. Sino-Japanese compound. How that morphed must have been fascinating. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of Sino-Japanese compounds, yeah. Isn't there a problem with getting computer languages to handle Chinese uh, because of the, you know, the writing system? Is so totally different. Uh, how how do the Chinese get around that? I don't know. They do it phonetically, so they know. Oh, they, they, they do. They bypass their writing system. So they say this is F O. Let's say Fong, right? F O N G, and so they, they literally type in F O, and then it spits up a bunch of options, mm -hmm. and so it's F O O, and then but you choose N G. And that narrows down the options, and these are all your options for Fong. And oh, so they so Ch Ch Chinese is actually done. It's you just it's, disregard the writing system. That's all. Yeah, phonetically. Yeah, phonetically. Yeah. And it, it spits up options for you to choose the ideogram. 
because there's so many there's so many homonyms. You know, Chinese is full of homonyms. I've wondered about this. It's like when you do on your telephone, like yeah, and you're because I now can't see that well. I dictate my texts, but even if you don't dictate, even if you're typing and you have Apple like autocorrect, sometimes if you don't look at what you're sending, you send some horrible yeah. message. Oh, yeah. but, but what this means is that is that the computers are not using the ideographic form of writing at all. Oh no, they are because it, it has its own. Barcode or whatever, yeah. you know, bunches of ones and zeros. But just the way to that barcode is mm -hmm. phonetic. It's phonetic. That's the fastest way to get to it. Right, right. The Japanese does a similar which, thing. Which makes sense because language is phonetic. By the way, both Chinese, but Chinese to a larger extent, the Japanese have many homonyms. You know what a homonym is? Yes. Something which is pronounced the same way but means something different. And Chinese is full of them. Yeah. And the way that they discriminate is by writing the characters. The Chinese characters are different. So Fong may have three different ways of being written, meaning different things. And the meaning only comes in context and also orthographically. In Japanese, you have what are called syllabaries. So they take the phonetic element and make it into a sign, which is not a Chinese character. So they can write something which is spoken. For instance, grammatical endings are written with using a syllabary, not Chinese characters. <clears throat> Japanese has the best of both worlds. You know, they can use Chinese for complicated notions using characters, which are which is how, you know how long it takes a Japanese child to be able to read the newspaper. <laughs> can you imagine? More. I think maybe now it's easier. When I was a child in Japan, and I associated with children, they could not read the daily newspaper until they were in the seventh or eighth grade, even though they were doing nothing but you know, studying language. Language is the most important, more than math or physics or chemistry, for a Japanese child to learn how to read is an enormous task. And as a foreigner learning Japanese, that's the big barrier to communicate. You know, when I went to Japan as a postdoctoral student in 1962, I think, I went to the university. I could speak Japanese fluently, but I'd never had exposure to academic conversation. So guess what I did? I went to a language school for four months. I did nothing but study Japanese language together with other foreign students, where the instruction was conducted exclusively in Japanese. It didn't matter whether you were Thai or British or American or Indonesian. Everything was in Japanese. And we all learned how to read and write. And then I transferred to the University of Tokyo. <laughs> you know, because what kind of student is a graduate student, postdoctoral? I already had my PhD. And I couldn't write Japanese. I couldn't write a letter. So I learned how to do it quickly because I did nothing but that. Wow. Lived in a dormitory at the school where we studied all day long, you know, from 8 in the morning till 5. There's nothing but Japanese instruction. And that's the kind of schooling that Japanese children get. Very long and hard, mostly to learn how to use their own language. Mm -hmm. Even though there's television, and I'm sure it's much easier now. If you watch enough TV, you learn how to speak it. But you're speaking it at home. But to write it is a big problem. <clears throat> so are we, uh, I'm sure there's no food, right? <laughs> Let me take a look. Maybe they surprise me. Kindness at me. No, no food. Sorry. I promised everybody food. I was wrong. Well, thank you again for coming. And if you have